Hey guys, this is Slow Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I wanted to let you guys know about the first Mises event of 2024. On February 17th, we will be returning to beautiful Tampa, Florida for an event dedicated to inflation, causes, consequences, and the cure. While the government tries to hide the consequences of inflation in their official statistics, Americans see and feel it every time they visit the grocery store. The state and its media lapdogs try to blame inflation on corporate greed, but the true source of inflation is the Federal Reserve and the banking system. We're going to be tackling this issue with a great lineup of speakers, including Joseph Salerno, Patrick Newman, and our new Mises president, the great Tom DeLorenzo. Uh, we have a special code for Radio Rothbard viewers for a 15% discount. That's uh, Rothbard24. And you can uh, find more about this event at Mises.org slash Tampa 2024. Hey, guys, this is the Bitch with Radio Rothbard, and we've got another great offer for Radio Rothbard listeners. We have a free book that we want to send directly to your doorstep. If you are a fan of this show, you have no doubt heard us discuss Murray Rothbard's classic Anatomy of the State his dive into the mechanics of the state as we know it, what the state fears, what its greatest threats are. It is one of the all-time best Rothbard reads, a personal favorite of both myself and Ryan. You can get your free copy as a Radio Rothbard listener by visiting Mises.org slash RothPodFree. That's R-O-T-H-P-O-D free. You can also find the link in our show notes. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. This is Tho Bishop, joined, as always, by my co-host, Ryan McMakin. And we've got a special guest today, Dr. Patrick Newman, author of Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, and um, among with other great Rothbard treatises that he has uh, translated and edited, um, a man that probably needs no rec uh, no uh, introduction to our audience. And the topic of today are some predictions for 2024 and continuing our conversation from last week about the economy, the state, the dollar, the Fed, all of those great topics. And I, in particular, wanted Patrick on this show uh, because if you have not seen it yet, I highly recommend it. He was one of our speakers at a recent Mises event in Fort Myers, Florida, on the topic of the Fed, inflation, uh, kind of the political ramifications for 2024. And there, uh, Patrick actually made a, a prediction that is aging quite nicely uh, about how the Fed might be bowing to some political pressures going into 2024, the recent uh, news from Powell uh, indicating a potential pivot in Fed policy. Um, again, the expectation, according to their great dot plot of perhaps even three interest rate cuts next year, um, seems to be uh, justifying um, some of Patrick's predictions made in there. And I know one prediction that we can uh, have for 2024 is a new edition of cronyism. Uh, uh, coming out, which I, I, I highly recommend already. I got to have a special uh, or early peek at some of the, the work that Patrick's been going on there. So that's all very exciting stuff. And so, Patrick, how are you doing in this last Radio Rothbard of uh, 2023? I'm doing good. First of all, thanks for having me on. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk to both of you about the economy and and, and all that entails and uh, doing doing well, getting ready for the the holiday season, I guess the uh, you know, Christmas is, um, you know, trying like so many other consumers trying to frantically buy gifts, uh, running down my savings to consume more. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, we, we uh, interested in uh, looking at the holiday data and the spending data and the retail sales and, and all of that stuff. So uh, the end of the year is going nicely. I hope you guys are doing well as, uh, as well. Well, you've already torn down the facade we have, so sorry to our audience. We are recording this uh, before Christmas, 
So if there's anything crazy that happens in the news cycle between here and there, that will help uh, explain why we might not be mentioning um, some sort of uh, a great global catastrophe or some black swan event that uh, might have come out between now and uh, after Christmas. Um, but with, with that being said, um, starting off again as a uh, historian, as an expert on cronyism, uh, you have never shied away from your analysis on monetary policy, what the Fed's going to do next, uh, buying into the great myth of our times of Fed independence and uh, the separation of central bank and power. And um, so just starting off, you know, again, given that uh, for those who may not be aware, there is a presidential election going on next year. Um, kind of what, what are your general thoughts and expectations uh, going into, you know, what is uh, going to certainly going to be the, the most important election of our lifetimes? Yes, yes. The, the, the This is year... X, which means we know that year X plus one, that's the most important election coming up. So we all need to be, we all need to be ready for that. And it's certainly going to be an interesting year. I mean, I, <laughs> at least until yesterday, I was saying there's a high, high chance of a Trump Biden rematch, but now, um, we've got to figure out if, if, if Trump's going to be on the ballot though. I, I think he will. I think that's just some, uh, in case you don't, for people who don't know the Colorado Supreme court, um, has basically tried to throw Trump off the ballot. I, I think that's a little bit of political theater, but but we'll see. Um, so it, it's certainly going to be, I think, an interesting year, uh, just because of of of, of the of, of election years always are. And we, I think, it's clear that we've ended the this the end of the rate hiking the the rate hiking cycle, so to speak, the end of the rate hikes, and now we're kind of in this period where as uh, everybody's jonesing for a rate cut, so to speak. Right. Everybody's getting ready for 25, 50, 75 basis points. And the Fed not too long ago uh, kind of let it slip that they're maybe thinking about 75 basis points of, of cuts. So like three cuts, I believe, of, of about two, 2.5 percent each percentage points each. And that is going to that that has led to a lot of um you, you could say optimism in the stock market, optimism among various sectors of the economy, uh, hoping that the Fed is going to lower rates, uh, not only by that, but by so much more. Right. So the Fed is trying to engage in what they have previously called forward guidance. They're trying to tell you in the present what they're going to do in the future in the hopes that that will influence your actions in the present. So they're saying that we're going to cut rates. Uh, it's sort of like the dragons in Game of Thrones, right? They're going to be coming, right? The rate, the rate cuts, they're coming. And uh, that's going to try to make people more optimistic now to think that, well, this tight money isn't going to last. It's okay to, it's okay to spend. It's okay to invest in the stock market and so on. And, and, and right now markets are kind of taking the ball and going with it. And the Fed is trying to now, of course, rein them in. But I think it's going to be an interesting an interesting story. I mean, we'll talk much more about this um, over over the podcast, but just to try to figure out, OK, well, as economic conditions kind of continue to soften, so to speak, um, especially among various sectors like commercial real estate and other areas. Is the Fed going to cut? How much are they going to cut during 2024? Will inflation, that final mile, prove the most difficult to get rid of? I mean, I thought it was quite astonishing. The Fed was saying they're going to pivot when Inflation's at three percent, and core inflation's at four uh, percent. It's almost as if you go on this diet for like fifteen weeks, and you're not even at your weight goal, but you're already planning your cheat meals, right? You know, you're sort of doing something like that. And it's like, well, aren't you supposed to stay on the diet? You know, you go on the low carb diet, you're supposed to remain on it. It's not just you don't eat pasta for two months and then you can go get you know Little Caesars pizza, something like that. Yeah, and it's interesting. One of my favorite measures of inflation is the uh, the salary increases that the uh, Fed gives their own, the federal government gives their own employees. As I mentioned uh, last week with uh, with Mark, that I've got a buddy that is part of that apparatus. Getting glad he's getting that money rather than others. And uh, the the salary increase in his division was uh, over five percent this year. So that, that's his own measurement there. What the Fed really sees the increase in cost of living. Um, but I, I know one of the topics, and you made a rather bold 
prediction during that five, uh, Fort Myers event, which again, I encourage everyone to see in full detail, get to, get to see Patrick on our wonderful uh, camera setup that we have there and your great PowerPoint skills, um, is that while we had other, uh, other speakers predicting a recession for 2024, um, you thought that it might hold off um, in part because of a, the potential for the Fed softening some of its stands there. And uh, so can you address that a, a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So first, you know, when it comes to forecasting, I've learned that forecasting is, can be a crapshoot. It, it's, just, it's just a crapshoot. There's, it's, it's economic yeah, history. We're putting on you the spot right now, Patrick. If yeah. people are going to be out there you know, putting all of their – they're, they're going to be, be Patrick yeah. Newman maximalists. Yeah, and uh, they're gonna they're gonna bet their entire fortune based on what you say next. <laughs> yeah, so I would say the most uh, best store of value is not gold, it's not Bitcoin, it's it's copies of cronyism. Um, there you go. Th that value will remain constant. So if you want to protect yourself against the coming catastrophe, stockpile on cronyisms and also um, uh, the next one that's going to come out. No, uh, but yeah, one, one uh, so cronyism equals one cronyism. Exactly, one cronyism equals one cronyism. It's 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 a unit of account. It's a measuring rod. Uh, we, 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 we 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 it's it's, it's constant. Um, so <laughs> so uh, yeah, forecasting can be very very tough, right? A lot of people, not just Austrians, were predicting a recession. If this was late 2022, saying that well, we are entering a recession in 2023, that did not materialize. At least they've announced, right? You know, we can look at the data, kind of um, try and look under the hood and, and see what's going on. But, you know, in terms of a, a visible recession of rising unemployment, we haven't seen that. Just like a year before, uh, people were saying inflation wasn't going to be a problem. And then inflation uh, was a problem and so on. So, of course, what happens um, in, in 2024? I mean, I adhere to Austrian business cycle theory. I think that the data is least consistent with that. So we should expect some sort of tightening to lead to you know, deteriorating economic condition. However, timing uh, is always uh, a factor. How quickly the Fed tightens, uh, you know, engages in credit contraction, how long it takes for that to affect the actual economy. What else is going on around the same time? Um, any sort of positive supply shocks? Over the past year, we've been hit with certainly a very big positive supply shock that we're still feeling the ramifications of, and that's, of course, artificial intelligence. Um, it's no coincidence that I, I think that the last successful um, uh, soft landing that the Fed engineered, quote unquote, was in 1995. Shortly thereafter, you saw the big rise of the Internet um, and, and around that time. So could there be something like that? Potentially. But you know, I, I think that when we're when we're looking at how long it takes for the Fed tightening to affect the economy, I was looking at gross domestic product as a measure of nominal spending, and it showed that at least looking at it over the past year, since since like mid twenty twenty two through mid twenty twenty three, nominal spending hadn't really cooled down that much, right? Which meant that the Fed's tightening had not yet affected the economy. However, uh, about a month or so after. Um, statistics on gross domestic income, which is the flip side of gross domestic product for all the money spent on final goods and services, someone has to actually earn that in the form of wages, rents, profits, whatever. And it's been a bit of a conundrum among economists. Usually those numbers are a little different with measurement error. Post-COVID, they've been more different than average, to, to say the least. And in 2022, when a lot of people were saying there was going to be a recession, uh, various people saying that you know, inflation was transitory or all sorts of other things were OK. Uh, you know, Janet Yellen was one of these people saying that, well, even though gross domestic products going down, you also have to look at gross domestic income, which is doing relatively strong and we should average them together. And when you average them together, you see there's no recession in 2022. OK, fair enough. But now that it's kind of flipped the other way, where now GDP is stronger than GDI, you don't hear that anymore. But when you average the two of them, uh, both the nominal series and the real series, which is not something original to me, there's plenty of economists trying to do this, the economic condition in 2023 does look a bit weaker. I mean, there's still been growth um, among a variety of metrics. Uh, earnings of corporations are still relatively strong. Um, uh, you know, there, you haven't seen the, the cratering and, and unemployment or, or other things, 
But there has been a, a slowdown in, in nominal spending, at least looking at that. Now, does that really change what I was saying so much? I mean, it does say that nominal spending is cooling, um, but I still think there is, it does take time for this to really start to affect the economy. And a big part of this is that in 2024, really in late 2024, and especially in 2025, a lot of corporations are going to have to refinance their debt. And this is also true for commercial real estate loans, which are coming due in 2024. I think the residential housing market is in stronger shape than the commercial uh, real estate market, which is a big bit of a big issue because occupancy is still not returned to pre-COVID levels. And this is going to put these companies in binds because they're going to have to borrow at higher real interest rates. And I think that's when you're going to start to see sort of this the more visible kind of deterioration. Um, I still think it's 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 I don't think it's going to happen like, you know, it's going to happen like this big crash initially after the Fed last raised rates um, in um, we could say 2005, 2006. I mean, we really didn't start to see things deteriorate until the second half of 2007, right? And th even then, the NBER didn't declare that there was a recession until 2008. And they said, oh, yeah, something began um, you know, a, a quite a bit earlier. So I think that there's a room for a couple of things trying to weigh you know, likely scenarios. This isn't the only thing that could happen. This is, I think, something that's um, you know, the most likely, at least looking at the data, is that you know, inflation is still going to be above target for a bit, getting to that final 2% uh, and maintaining it is crucial. I think that might take a little bit longer. Uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll just have to see. It could dip down to 2%, but then there could be pressure putting it back up. I think the economy is is going to kind of let some air out, uh, but things are still going to keep chugging. And then I think you're going to start to see some problems become more and more manifest with commercial real estate and other sorts of interest uh, interest rate uh, sectors and re really a lot of uh, particularly some corporations and so on. But that's enough of my rambling for now. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully I've made some sort of sense. Right. Well, I think something to note is uh, it's easy to overestimate how much the money supply has gone down in recent months and to underestimate just how huge was the injection of new money into the economy. Uh, since 2020. Um, now, I publish on the site these monthly updates as to where the money supply is when calculated by the uh, by Rothbard and Salerno's uh, Austrian method that they developed, uh, boy, at least uh, 30 years ago. And if you look at that, yes, year over year, the, the total money supply plummeted uh, for the last year. Um, but even then, when you look at the total amount, you're still way above trend. I mean, you still got to knock off like another four trillion on uh, the total money supply by that measure just to get back to the what was already a significant uh, uptrend that had occurred before 2020. And in recent months, the month to month number in money supply is basically flattened out. Uh, so it has not continued on a significant downward trajectory. So. When you see this, re these remarkable amounts of spending still going on in the economy, you can guess as to, well, I mean, you're still dealing with that huge injection of money that occurred over a period of two years uh, from 2020 through 2022, and it just hasn't gone away. And then on top of that, you've got, as Daniel Lacaye points out, you've got massive amounts of deficit spending. Um, that the government continues to engage in. And that's plugging a lot of holes in terms of potential declines in overall spending. So it's it's not a traditional situation at all where you just, oh, look, all of these bubbles are popping because all of the extra money has already gone out of the economy. That just doesn't seem to be the situation at all. Uh, yeah, I, I, th those are those are great points. I, I, the, the money supply, it's <laughs> you, 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 we were at 450 pounds, right? Morbidly obese, and we're sort of down to like 320. Significant progress, right? Maybe I'll put us at 280, right? Big weight loss. But again, don't start talking about the cheat meals yet, so to speak. Like, you know, it's still, uh, it's, it's still a problematic weight. And especially because 
the, the demand for money has been declining or in a little bit more mainstream terminology, velocity has been rising and that's been keeping up spending. And people have just been de- depleting their quote unquote COVID savings, right? The, the, the excess money that um, the excess cash balances from all the, all the money printing. And, you know, we, we are still seeing, uh, yeah, can continued, um, c- c- continued growth in the, 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 the spending aggregates is still going up and there's still more room because, and this is just the post 2008 world that we live in. There's so much extra gas in the tank that the banks, the commercial banking system can use to create loans or even, you know, the, the, the fed. So we already started to see this a bit where markets went nuts after the fed had the pivot. And we, we saw um, uh, various bond yields decline or uh, interest rates on, um, on, on, on various loans and so on. And, the, the markets or the commercial banks almost or the financial sector is they're they're they're, they're already borrowing against the future, <laughs> the future rate cuts, so to speak. Right. And, and you know, that's that's kind of where um, it is. The market is. And, and now the Fed's kind of trying to pedal back some of its 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 statements saying, well, you know, we don't want to go that far. Don't think that there's going to be a cut in March. Right. People were already expecting some sort of cut in March. I, I think one of the. You, oh, yeah. Before getting into that, I thought you made a, a great point regarding um, uh, the deficit spending. That's another big issue. I think that's almost one of the biggest pressures the Fed faces is Uncle Sam. The interest rate costs uh, have been ballooning for Congress and they want to have some method of uh, basically lowering that. The deficit as a percentage of GDP is poised to increase. In 2023, when we get the full data out compared to 2022, which is kind of unusual for a quote unquote non-recession year. And uh, that's going to pose uh, additional uh, pressures and and difficulties. I also thought, I believe it was Douglas McKenzie on the private sector unemployment figure, private sector as a proportion, you know, like as a proportion of the overall uh, jobs numbers showing that. Uh, you know, a lot of it's been driven by government jobs, and mm-hmm. this at least is uh, correlating with a, a, a recession in the future. I mean, I think post-1970, at least, if you go back further and can get a little bit more murky, post-1970, at least is signaling sort of a weakening labor market. And I think it'd be very interesting to to continue to look at that. But, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of in this, I guess I would say, this this world where we're now trying to figure out, all right, what's the new post-COVID normal and you know, where are interest rates headed, right? Because I don't think we're going back to the less than 1% interest rates, even you know, after the inflation and, and, and after the business cycle and so on. I think there's just too many structural changes. I think you have less savings overall, just from more and more baby boomers um, going into their golden years and all of that, and that's just putting more pressure on the the economy. And I think that's going to pose some structural problems that we aren't really forecasting or we aren't really taking consideration yet. And I think just it's it's the, the mood is 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 for rate cuts because the one point or what one, one thing that makes this very different from prior rate cycles is of course social media where now you've got so many people constantly commenting and saying, oh, we, you know, this is what the Fed should do. This is what the Fed should do. I think its ability to practice contractionary monetary policy with actually elevated real inflation adjusted interest rates is going to be a lot harder because there's going to be constant pressure on the Fed um, to say to lower, um, you know, to, to, you know, even if the unemployment rate starts to creep up and you're going to see this happen and you'll especially see this happen in 2024, when um, the Trump derangement syndrome probably uh, starts to affect a lot of people, you know, it goes into stage three or something, and it's just, it's all kind of wrapped up in this. And I think it's likely that, I, I you know, we'll, we'll just kind of see the economic situation continue in its current state for a bit, but that doesn't mean that a soft landing has been achieved. It takes more time to figure that out. And I think there still is some potential for uh, some problems to resurface for the Fed that markets are not fully anticipating right now. Well, there's another interesting dynamic out there. Um, There was a a hearing um, a few weeks ago 
with uh, the Senate Banking Committee, where you know when we talk about um, money supply increases, obviously I, th- I think a lot of our audience understands that it's not simply what the Fed does that the banks play a major role uh, in the creation of money. And one of the issues out there that doesn't get a, a whole lot of attention, um, but it's uh, a dynamic where the Fed, um, the FDIC, and the Office of the Com- Comptroller has um, pushed for uh, new basal regulations, which is you know, just some of the uh, you know, kind of banking regulations, and there's been various iterations, you know, particularly since the, the financial crisis, um, that will increase the reserve requirements for banks that have at least $100 billion in assets. So, um, you know, I think it's like 37 banks out there. So these are like the biggest banks out there. And it's, it's interesting seeing play out where you see um, bipartisan ship on both sides of this issue, you know, where you have the JP Morgans of the world going out there and warning that if you actually require the banks to hold more, um, more reserves, then that is going to, you know, increase the costs of, of lending and things like that. Um, and so there's a lot of push to prevent these regulations from coming into play. And so that's an, that's an aspect there where these banks are having to operate right now with the expectation that these rules are going to go into effect, but should that aspect of the regulatory side get taken away? And then again, it seems as a whole, again, with that sort of bipartisan cooperation, yeah, it's, it's, it's poss- quite possible that that ends up being the result there. Um, the way that that will free up some of these banks to, to you know, increase the money supply that they are currently not kind of engaging in is an, another one of those, you know, kind of inflation aspects out there. Um, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out um, going forward in the years ahead. Yeah, it, it, it will be interesting. Well, it's funny because the Fed has more or less gotten rid of reserve requirements uh, since COVID. They're like, yeah, they don't really matter anymore. And it's, it's teaching this to my students. I have to te- you know, I teach them in basic macroeconomics, you go through the four tools of monetary policy. It used to be three, now it's four, but you go you go through reserve requirements. You know, like after you go, well, yeah, none of this matters anymore, at least for now. We'll find out though, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what, what will happen. Um, the So far, banks have, have, have weathered the storm, so to speak, quite well. At the beginning of the year, there was uh, the Silicon Valley Bank and, and problems and lots of fear over smaller banks and the fed had stopped its its expansionary excuse me it's it's contractionary monetary policy um it's it's quantitative tightening briefly and um, i i thought this could have met sort of the end of that but then they've continued this the um the small banks have at least held up they you know there's been no big collapses though of course one thing to keep an eye out is a lot of commercial real estate is held by small banks. So if commercial real estate starts to suffer, uh, these small regional banks are really going to um, take to take a hit. And uh, we might be able to have some sort of inkling of how this will play out after the holiday season, uh, because it'll be very interesting to see what's the split between uh, online orders and you know, traditional brick and mortar retail stores, uh, especially with malls and and all you know just regular department stores and all of that. But that's sort of a side note. I mean, I I think as as Ryan kind of uh, alluded to, as Ryan mentioned with the money supply, looking at things such as deposits and bank loans, those have all kind of flatlined. And it seems as though any sort of further tightening or decline is going to require the Fed to do something more. But now it's almost as if, um, yeah, they've, they've kind of bottomed out, if you will. And it'll be interesting to see yeah, the, the, the banking sector, will they actually continue to restrict or will these new types of regulations or guidelines be put in place? Yeah, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see how much of that happens, especially in early to mid 2024. Uh, I, um, I'm not too confident a whole lot will be done on that, but that's uh, it, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it, it's definitely an interesting factor to look at. Well, even like the, the regional banks after Silicon Valley, um, you know, the, the Fed came in and, you know, there's been all sorts of, of help provided to some of those banks, um, again, with, with some of those concerns out there about commercial uh, uh, commercial real estate in particular and, and the way that regional banks are, are far more leveraged with uh, uh, those loans. 
the, the big banks out there. And so it'll be interesting to see, you know, you know as, as with every temporary measure, as we've seen from the Fed, I'm sure we have, we can have complete confidence um, that the, 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 you know, kind of bumpers in the, uh, the bowling lane uh, will, will certainly be taken away um, as, as they promised. I think it was a year long program and it has no, no chance at all of being expanded uh, going forward because everything is so, so uh, top notch going on right now. Uh, but again, another aspect where you know there's been uh, additional support given to the financial system, um, you know, during this uh, time of uh, surreal economic performance in the eyes of Paul Krugman. Yeah. Well, I think uh, one question too is that the listeners might have is okay when we say that there's no recession in 2024, what what do we really mean by that? Like, what does the economy look like? And you try and search for historical situations. I think maybe you can you can point to situations where they've traded in recession for inflation in many cases. So say in the second half of the 70s, right? It would, they were able to hold off an inflation for a while there, and or rather they were able to hold off a recession for a while there. You were just kind of banking on, okay, let's just keep the money supply going and we can push out this recession uh, hopefully into the 80s. And uh, so that can work. The problem, of course, is that inflation is is the downside. And then you maybe Japan, maybe Japan's another example where after decades you had a weak economy, and it was a different situation. Uh, it was you had uh, deflationary factors in many cases there, but you had an economy that went on for a long time, and the standard of living went down very gradually. But you avoided recession for a very long period of time. And so when we're talking about, all right, we, uh, we've caved, we've, we've, uh, we've decided that we can live with more inflation in order to avoid any significant declines in uh, overall employment. What does that really look like then in the daily lives of ordinary people, especially younger people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's, that's a it's a great it's a great uh, question. Uh, and since you mentioned inflation, I was just thinking of, thinking of this because uh, it, it relates to what you're saying with higher inflation. Not too long ago, Jay Powell came out with a new basically guideline the Fed was going to follow, where it wasn't going to be a strict two percent target, but it was almost going to be you let inflation go above two percent uh, after the years when it's been below two percent, and then you're supposed to kind of let inflation go under two percent. Um, after inflation's been above 2%, so if inflation is running for, say, 5% one year, then the Fed wants it to maybe run at like 1% um, the next two years or something, right, to bring us down to the long run average of inflation, uh, of 2% inflation. And, and we're not even there yet. So going off that, then we should expect um, a couple of years of below 2% inflation, but we're not even... So that, that already has kind of been sort of thrown off the table, at least. So it seems as though the Fed doesn't want to try to do that. And, you know, that, that's, of course, very, uh, very t telling in itself. And, and, and yeah, the, the trade-off could be the, 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 you know, the Fed keeps the boom going, so to speak. And so I think you could either see higher than average inflation, right? And that would then, of course, hurt real wages. Real wages have kind of been, they've been rising since 2019 after you look at a bunch of stuff and adjusted for inflation, but they're below where they would have been, uh, much like the average of gross domestic product and gross domestic uh, um, uh, 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 gross domestic income, right? So, you, you know, you, you could see the stagnation uh, that way through inflation or inflation is above target, uh, or you could see it, and this could also happen, of course, with inflation, but we don't necessarily need to see price inflation with this, as is what we've all been kind of talking about, which happened in Japan, as well as even happening in the United States after the financial crisis, which is, yeah, we saw a recovery um, you know, in 2000 and late 2009, 2010, but it was very weak. And it was a weak re recovery. And you kind of saw, the, you know, not stagnating, but it was very weak until about 2015, uh, 2016. And that poses its own share of problems where, okay, unemployment's falling, but labor force participation is falling just because more and more people are getting discouraged. Uh, baby boomers were retiring early and just sort of leaving the labor market. Uh, you saw these sort of unequal gains 
in income. Uh, of course, if you were invested in the stock market, you did you did relatively well during those years. But for other people, you saw this kind of stagnation in your earnings and in kind of setback generational wise. There's a lot of um, statistics. I mean, it's the old it's the old saying: lies, damn lies, in, in statistics. Uh, going off to all right, how are the uh, generation? Uh, how are the millennials doing relative to their parents, the baby boomers, or how much wealth has been added since 2019? And a lot of people are some some studies have shown uh, that it's like, oh well, it's actually gone up. Now, aside from the recent kind of stock market boom. Uh, the main reason for that is because of home prices. Home prices have not appreciably got da- gone down, um, which is good if you own a home. But of course, <laughs> you know, if you don't own a home, right? Good luck buying at those prices, and then good luck borrowing at those interest rates. You know, mortgage rates are north of seven percent, and home prices are incredibly high. I mean, that's just that's a that's a big issue. And so, you're of course for a lot of uh, younger people, you could be delaying when you're getting a home, right? When you're expanding. Of course, that means you could be delaying when you're building up your family, having having children, um, building building your reserve pool of workers, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so that's one way it can kind of manifest itself. I mean, we're going to see what will happen. Will this be, all right, inflation is going to go above target and we're going to have to deal with the problems related to inflation? Or is this going to be, uh, you know, something like uh, you know, Japan or the United States, where there's going to be kind of this stagnation and growth is still kind of occurring, but it people aren't really happy with it. You know, those are just, if we're looking at sort of from a, a more grimmer perspective, those are, I think, the two most likely ways. And yeah, you would just continue to see young people getting hurt, being getting set back developmentally. Um, I, I, this is in the United States, but I mean, reading about China, uh, being a young worker in China right now is is not <laughs> not an enviable position. Uh, the whole uh, uh, lying flat or letting it rot sort of mentality—I think that's what it's called there now—is just um, it's really problematic because young people in China are getting totally disillusioned with uh, the economy, and young people here are not yet. But that is something that could certainly be in store later in the decade. Well, and then on top of this, there's all sorts of uh, uh, geopolitical issues that, uh, as we have seen, play out uh, kind of all sorts of interesting consequences. Um, actually, while we were recording, I, I saw that there was a uh, that, that uh, she has sent a message to the Biden administration that uh, they are indeed planning to reunify with Taiwan, um, which is one of those uh, conflict zones out there that there is a, a lot of uh, bipartisan uh, consensus on. Um, even while skepticism out there on Ukraine is picked up, and you know, while there is a, 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 the, the Middle Eastern situation being on there, so you know, we have a perhaps could have yet a, another uh, uh, you know, active uh, military geopolitical situation that we could add to the ever-growing deck of uh, uh, geopolitical threats out there uh, as well. Um, again, yeah, I, it, I've seen a lot of. It's interesting to see, and I, I think this kind of speaks to um, some of the economic anxiety out there. Is that uh, you know there there you know, you know, a lot of the defenders of the um, economic status quo, a lot of the people that uh, you know, cheerlead when all of these new government statistic reports out there that you know, brag about this this great jobs report or um, look how much progress we're making in inflation if we don't include you know little things like food and energy. Um, they uh, dismiss all of the the uh, pessimism out there as just vibes. Like we're we're in a, we're in a vibes recession, um, but I think going into the new year, um, you know, uh, the the ramifications from COVID, um, the ramifications from inflation, the issues that young people in particular are having with the unique generational uh, economic. Uh, pressures that uh, millennials and Zoomers are facing, you know, it, it seems that the the sort of mentality going into the new year is, is not quite the the optimistic hopes that next year is going to be better, um, but a a lot of gener- of, of sincere and kind of broad angst and and concerns about where we are going. Uh, but but luckily we've got such a a wonderful uh, political substantive political campaign. Um, to look forward to, which I'm sure will will do nothing but bolster the uh, uh, faith 
that the the public writ large has with the decision makers out there for all the challenges that uh, DC will have uh, facing it come uh, 2024. Yeah, the the, uh, the year has 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 been total a bunch of surprises in terms of the foreign policy development. I mean, who would have known that getting involved in a a land war against Russia would turn into a war of attrition? I mean, that's that's unprecedented in history. Uh, you know, for anyone, of course, who knows history, that's that that's that's not the case. Of course, that that war is turning into a stalemate, a uh, real tragedy for the people of 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 Ukraine and Russia and everyone involved. I mean, some of the uh, the casualties are are just simply. Um, uh, abominable. And, and, and that's kind of spreading. I mean, there's now there's Venezuela and Guyana. I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is, this is incredible. My, my old Grover Cleveland, I'm literally looking, I have a picture of Grover Cleveland right there. I mean, he, he, he had a very hawkish position on this, but I'm like, are we going back to that? Right? Like what, what's, of course we're not going to uh, fight the British, but, um, <laughs> uh, on that, that medicine that, is rolling in his grave at the yeah. idea of, uh, Chinese, uh, military support in, in Venezuela. Yeah, I know the, the, the Monroe, the Monroe doctrine, right? We, we've, Monroe, we've got a, yeah, we've, yeah, it's the Monroe doctrine. And now it also extends into, um, uh, uh, Europe as well for as sometimes I like to jokingly, it's the, it's the North American treaty organization. It's not really the North Atlantic, but, uh, yeah, we're seeing that. Of course, there's, there's a uh, tragedy in, in the Middle East and now, uh, you know, we're seeing something in, happening in, in, in Taiwan. I, uh, you know, <laughs> China, Chinese Civil War, right? Like the 1948, 49, you know, this is whole Shanghai Chiang, Shek. Uh, I read it, read into all the history of um, doing a lot of research on the Marshall Plan right now. And so there's this sort of fa- fascinating stuff with China because China was actually included in that. But yeah, we're seeing this. I, I do think that if we take the most mainstream position on the economy and other stuff, we could say, okay, Biden, aside from the vibes recession, something you mentioned, I think it's God, you mentioned that we could talk about the, 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 we could say, okay, he's, he's, he's doing okay in those areas, right? The unemployment rate is, is, is strong and, you know, the economy is doing well. The foreign policy issue, you know, the foreign policy realm, that's something that could really kind of cascade into a bunch of problems because not only was there the perceived debacle in Afghanistan, but you know, you've got this war in Ukraine, Russia's uh, heavily militarizing its economy because of all the you know, dispute over that. And now Europe is, is faced with the prospect of, of, of having to pay for, for, for some of this stuff on its own. Uh, you've got the Middle East, um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's become a big crisis issue because uh, Israel is, is, is under a lot of um, uh, criticism, at least of some of the policies they've been pursuing. And that, of course, leads to its, its usual controversies um, in, the, in the Middle East, potentially something in, in Venezuela. And now there's the Taiwan thing, right, which we'll yeah. see what that turns into. But, you know, the, the American empire that world, the, the unipolar world, right, I, I, I think as it's been described sometimes is, is – it, it's not, uh, it, it could be in this own turning point, and that in, in turn could lead to difficulties with the dollar uh, because the sanctions against Russia really haven't worked. And, and there's a large part of the world that is okay with not listening to us on foreign policy. So there are some of those anxieties. I certainly think those anxieties are higher in Europe because they think, you know, Putin's going to invade and. I'm not really. That's a whole different conversation. I, I just think that's that's a lot of bluster. But you know, the, yeah, this is the the American world power is is it could be entering kind of this new phase. We have entered this new phase. We're not the only world power, right? And yeah, so foreign policy poses some of its own uh, unique um, challenges in 2024. Yeah, I just know that uh, 2024. It's 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 not 1998. For those of us who <laughs> remember uh, the late '90s, where the most controversy you could come up with was um, Bill Clinton's impeachment trial over, you know, his sexual escapades in the uh, in the, the the Oval Office, and other than that, nobody really cared about anything, um, and certainly nothing like the geopolitical issues that we're looking at right now. And so those things could become critical, reach a critical stage at any time. It's just Hard to say, does it boil over in 2024 or at some time in the future? Uh, America has been involved in essentially, and I said this to uh, Tho 
uh, yesterday as we were just talking about some issues related uh, to foreign policy is that the world of, of the late 1940s still exists largely. This post-World War II consensus where the U.S. is accepted as the world leader and that, that tells us a lot about the state of the dollar and the U.S. economy. And you were in a holding pattern for all of that period until recently. And uh, whereas in contrast, the world of say 1920, that's long gone. That's, that's not something that's really very relevant to us right now. However, that, that post-1945 world does appear to be slipping away and it's, it will be impossible to predict uh, exactly how that plays out in terms of the economy and the U.S.'s uh, position in the world. And this does tend to filter down to just basic standard of living issues uh, that many people will experience just on an everyday level. But it's really hard to predict what that means. But 2024 could be a significant year for changes in that. I, the 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 in, in terms of the economy when it comes to the geopolitical developments I know you know obviously oil is the biggest one you know what would happen to oil and in gas I mean something that is important to note though is that a lot of non OPEC plus countries have been expanding you know especially the United States sort of ironic uh, given the president's you know position on 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 you know oil but you know that has that production has increased uh, significantly so. I'm not sure of how any new geopolitical conflict would lead to another um, spike in in oil prices. You know, it could happen. It's something to keep an eye out for. I mean, with Guyana, Guyana is a big big producer of, of oil. There's potential for the Israel Hamas conflict to spread out into wi wider oil markets with uh, Iran. That has not happened yet. Um, but yeah, it, it, it will just be interesting to see in general. Now, how it will affect the the overall mood? Um, I, I I don't know if that'll happen in 2024 or or later, but I mean, it's certainly we're we're seeing sort of yeah the 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 I don't know if it's the last gasp or another way of trying to reassert its dominance of the of the post World War II era, right? This is the the you know the baby boomers are now you know <laughs> they they grew up in that world and you know they're not gonna try to continue it, uh, so, so, so to speak. I, I think a lot of the, uh, it, it, like a lot of the stuff with Russia, I think is, well, it's the usual, it's just like the Cold War, right? It's like, well, well, but that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation. But I mean, the point is, is that, yeah, I agree with you guys completely. It's that foreign policy is sort of a, an X factor um, that can affect a lot of things, but still trying to see where things, uh, how, how things pan out on that front. Well, Ryan, it might not be 1998 in America anymore, but I did see that uh, Disney is going to be releasing a, a new, uh, more diverse X Files. <laughs> so at least we have that to look <laughs> That's forward right. to. They bought Fox. Um, yeah, yeah. It, any uh, uh, before we leave, any uh, uh, New Year's resolutions for the new year uh, for for either of you? Mm. Good. Yeah. Uh, no, but before getting to New Year's resolution, I'll try to stall for time. I remember speaking of down. Um, it's like the late 90s, the lack of news. Uh, before 9-11 in the summer of 2001, I think all the focus was on like shark attacks at the beach, yeah. right? And that was that was in the news cycle. So could we only go back to the shark attacks, right? Like if that was the problem facing us, right? The, the, the deadly shark attacks, what are we supposed to do? If only. Um, New Year's resolutions, that's, that's you know, I, I don't really, I, I just sort of, I have rolling resolutions. So I have, well, you know, I'd like to lose lose five pounds. I, I want to read more of this. I want to try not get as, 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 as angry at, 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 or frustrated with the state of the world, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic for myself for 2024, let's say, at least that's the perspective that, that you should have. I don't know. Do you guys have any new year's resolutions? Well, I've got, I've got a kid in college. So my resolution is not to starve to death after paying tuition bills uh, in this year. Mm. Uh, that's probably my biggest concern on a personal level, uh, for sure. And that's not getting any cheaper. Um, and so those sorts mm -hmm. of those costs are very much at the forefront of my thinking. And so, but I am glad I'm not as young as some of the the thirty somethings I talk to who just face much bigger challenges. And but yeah, you've got to if you're making resolutions this year, I, I guess. 
in economic terms, you just got to like, okay, I resolved to come up with ways to not completely blow all of my savings as prices of everything go up. Cause I think that's just going to be the reality for a lot of people and not even us old timers, I think are exempt. Well, my, my resolution for 2024 is a new season of the Liberty versus power podcast. Uh, Addressing uh, cronyism part two um, for for the new year. So. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I'm, I'm hoping the book uh, you send it off to some people and want to see what they say. And and uh, yeah, the, that, that's another New Year's I guess resolution. Want to want to get cronies and published, and then we can we can work on another season of Liberty versus Power, right? Uh, so that's yeah. that's the. Uh, uh, that that that'll be the real bell bellwether. If cronyism gets published, no recession. If not, then you know the economy tanks, right? There, there you go. Yeah. Well, for a very stoic Patrick Newman, for a starving Ryan McMakin, this is uh, Tho Bishop for Radio Rothbard. It is uh, always fun to talk with you too. Thank you to all of our listeners. This has been a great year for Radio Rothbard traffic. It has been going through the roof uh, this year. If you haven't gotten your Radio Rothbard mug, it is a great uh, post-Christmas special uh, purchased for yourself. I know all of you had it on your Christmas lift. If uh, you did not get that, um, then you can still get that with a, a discount using the promo code ROTHPOD. Uh, thank you for listening to, to Radio Rothbard throughout the year. We will come back to you on 2024. Hey guys, this is Stoke Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I hope you've enjoyed our episode with Dr. Patrick Newman. As mentioned, I'm looking forward to getting back to the Liberty versus Power podcast, which was kind of a mini series we did talking about Dr. Newman's first book on cronyism. If you haven't yet watched that series or listened to that series, um, we're going to have the first episode as a special preview coming up here shortly. Uh, you can find the entire Liberty versus Power series at Mises.org slash LVP, as in Liberty versus Power. Or you can find the entire series on YouTube at the Mises Media page. My own basic perspective on the history of man is to place central importance on the great conflict, which is internally waged between liberty and power. A conflict, by the way, which was seen with crystal clarity by the American revolutionaries of the 18th century. Murray and Rothbard. This is the Liberty versus Power podcast. And the focus of this podcast is going to be to kind of expand on Rothbardian history. And for that, we have Dr. Patrick Newman, uh, one of the leading Rothbardian historians out there, the editor of Conceived in Liberty, Volume 5 in the Progressive Era and the author of the new release, Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America. Uh, Patrick, what does the, the liberty versus power framework sort of mean to you as an economic historian, you know, looking back at, you know, issues like cronyism and, and you know, looking at different eras of history? You know, what does it mean for you when you're applying this into new work? Yeah, so the I've, I'm someone very influenced by uh, Murray Rothbard, very influenced by his overall outlook on history, his his overarching narratives, uh, et cetera. And so, for me, studying cronyism, the history of, of you know, or excuse me, not the history, just the special interest policies, right, that benefit concentrated groups at the expense of the overall public, the liberty versus power theory is very important uh, when analyzing cronyism in early American history or just analyzing early American history in general, right? Because the liberty versus power theory is that history is a clash between the forces of smaller government, right? This is liberty and the forces of big government, big government and cronyism, et cetera. There's the forces of power. Right. So in early American history, this really does explain a lot of um, uh, various legislation and the battles, the political and the economic battles that were going on, because you did have a mass movement dedicated to libertarian goals, fighting cronyism, fighting for a smaller government. I and mean, this is America's 
libertarian heritage. It's its libertarian tradition. Murray Rothbard was always big on explaining this. That's why he he spent five volumes writing a, a history of, of 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 America during the colonial era, right? And so it's 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 important to understand because even though today there might not be as big of a mass movement in favor of liberty or politicians who are generally genuinely dedicated to it, it still has relevance for today. We can still see examples of it. But really, I think the key to understanding American history is understanding that American history is intertwined with libertarianism. And one of the things I think is, is kind of fun about this is that, you know, sometimes even Rothbard's kind of criticized this by some, you know, I think usually uh, unfair critics of, of kind of the kind of, kind of conspiracy theory sort of history, right? You kind of have that, the creature of Jekyll Island sort of analysis out there um, where, you know, when, when Rothbard's writing about the origins of the Federal Reserve, for example, you know, he names names, he, he, he identifies the elites, the, the motivations, uh, you know, at hand that was guiding this policy. Um, you know, you shared with me this, this great article uh, that was actually published in Reason in 1977, um, whereas Rothbard sort of defending kind of the conspiracy theory sort of lens of history, uh, uh, Murray uh, described it as the conspiracy analyst and said that really what they're serving is, is as a praxeologist, that that is, he believes that people act purposefully, that they make conscious choices to employ means in order to arrive at goals. Hence, if a steel tariff is passed, he assumes that the steel industry lobbied for it, if a public works project is created, he hypothesized that it was promoted by an alliance of construction firms and unions who enjoyed public works contracts and bureaucrats who expanded their jobs and incomes. It is the opponents of conspiracy analysis who uh, professes to believe that all events, at least in government, are random and unplanned and that therefore people do not engage in purpose of choice and planning. You know, and this is something that, that really comes out throughout a, a lot of Rothbard's histories, and not only in the Conceived and Liberty series um, that obviously you, you helped publish the, the fifth volume of, but you know he's, he's got you know really his, his 20th century analysis is so baked in. So the conflicts between the Morgan family and the Rockefeller family, the influence of the Dulles brothers on international relations and the like, you know it, it, it's something that I think is is interesting where again. This is something that can be dismissed by a certain type of scholar or, or even a libertarian as as being uh, a perhaps mean spirited or, or, or you know, missing, uh, you're applying bad motives. But yet, if we're actually looking at the way the state operates, there is these underlying agendas that are behind so much of what is done, you know, within the wheels of power, with the facade being of, of you know, general welfare or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I was always that was one of the first Murray Rothbard articles I had read, Conspiracy Theory of History, uh, you know, revisited. And it, 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 he, Rothbard goes through what he's really doing is he's applying Ludwig von Mises, his, his great mentor, uh, his 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 his, thymo, his theory of thymology. Right. So the science of praxeology is why, he, excuse me, praxeology is the science of studying the implications of human action. Right. So I'm hungry. I want to you know, eat a eat a sandwich. So now we got to, you know, analyze the whole implications of that. Am I going to go buy a sandwich? Whatever. Blah, 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 blah. Thymology, which Mises really fleshed out the most in his one of his last great works, which is theory and history, is the study of understanding why humans acted. It's really kind of a, a fancy word for we might think of psychologizing. So trying to understand the motivations of someone. So why did I eat this? You know, why did I want a sandwich with something that I had happened to me earlier in my life? Or am I part of, you know, the sandwich lobby or, you know, et cetera. And looking at understanding people's motivations, why they're making a choice. And this is especially relevant in the political arena right? Because a certain law is going to be passed. Okay, well, why was the law passed? A lot of uh, economists will study historical you know, history or various legislation, and they're just going to look at the economic effects of that. And very often, they're not going to look at it correctly, but that's a whole different other, you know, a side, uh, you know, the whole, whole different other podcast, basically. So a railroad uh, that was created, you know, railroad legislation in the 1860s, an economic historian is going to just say, all right, 
well, what are the quantitative effects on GDP of this uh, creating the railroads, right? They're not going to look as much at why were the railroads passed? What were the motivations that this railroad legislation uh, creating these railroads uh, was, you know, uh, uh, what was the underlying motivation of various individuals? That requires the thymological perspective, which is looking at various uh, you know, primary sources, so documentation, uh, understanding relevant actors' backgrounds, looking at, uh, you know, their, their diaries or their correspondence, what are they trying to get out of something, et cetera. And that provides a much more richer overview or analysis of the particular type of legislation you're looking at. And this really shows that a lot of the legislation is much more crony than uh, we are led to believe. Right. Because, uh, you know, they're much more developed, you know, based off of special interests trying to get something at the expense of the public. Because if you just look at what politicians state is their motivation, it's always going to be in the public interest. Right. If you want to push for some infrastructure bill, let's say you have to say, well, this is going to expand the American economy. This will do all sorts of wonderful things, et cetera. But what you don't see from that statement is, OK, what are the various special interests that have lobbied for this? Uh, you know, who are the who are they? what were they trying to get, et cetera. So Murray Rothbard's whole historical outlook, his analysis of various, you know, uh, the political process, everything from elections to the uh, pushing for various legislation, it's heavily Misesian. Mises himself might have not done this uh, because he mainly focused on theory, but it's really Rothbard's whole historical analysis is his application of Mises' theory in history. And it's funny because I, I think this kind of goes directly to some of the critiques out there of the Austrian school. Oh, you know, they try to pontificate from their armchairs, you know, all of the economic, you know, and analysis in the world on that sort of stuff. And, and that kind of gets directed to that core of, of, of dividing economic theory in, in, in the kind of narrow sense and then economic history you know, weaving in sort of the, the, the more complex fabric of human reality, you know, recognizing that we, have, we can't do controlled variables and the like, you know, it, it very much is that sort of Misesian foundation. Uh, George Pickering has a great sort of breakdown on the value of Rothbard's introduction to theory and history um, that Rothbard uh, wrote, um, which really kind of dives into the way that, you know, this Misesian understanding should be applied, obviously, it played a big role in Rothbard's career. Um, but I, I think one of the things that has also kind of helps your Rothbard being such a, a fascinating historical thinker on top of his political work, his, his you know, his, his economic work and whatever, is that his background wasn't simply limited to the work of Mises in this regard, but also mentors like, like uh, Joseph Dorfman, um, who was a, a great American economic historian in his own right. Uh, can you touch on some of Dorfman's influence on Rothbard and the way that, that kind of played into uh, kind of his understanding of American history. Yeah, so uh, Joseph Dorfman was Rothbard's dissertation advisor. So Rothbard had gotten his uh, PhD in economics at Columbia University. Uh, back in the day when Rothbard was at Columbia in the mid-1940s, really around the end of uh, World War II, tying in with the, the GI boom, Columbia University was one of the leading economics departments in the United States. It really was Harvard, Chicago, and Columbia. So Rothbard was uh, you know, immersing himself with the many of the elite scholars of the era. Joseph Dorfman was a noted historian of economic thought. He was what was known as an institution. Um, it's it, the meaning has changed since uh, Rothbard's time, but really institutionalists are very big on fact gathering and not being sort of anti theory, anti abstract theory. Much more uh, theory needs to be contingent on a particular historical episode, and you need to first gather a bunch of information before you can then basically devise a, a you know some sort of explanatory hypothesis, etc. And so Joe. Joseph Dorfman had written a multi-volume work, The Economic Mind in American Civilization. For those of you who can get a copy of this, I believe there are PDFs of it online uh, through Mises.org, and you're interested in the material, I recommend that you read it. 
the economic mind in American civilization. It's this, it's this great book. I used it a lot in my own book, Cronyism. And Dorfman, I think, really taught Rothbard to appreciate uh, just sort of being very intensive with facts. So collecting a lot of information, showing the various um, connections an individual has. Okay, who this this person talking about economic theory? Uh, you know, what were his connections? Did he own stock in some various companies that influenced his outlook? Joseph Dorfman did specialize in this, so that that was apparent in his own um, you know the economic mind series. And Rothbard learned a lot from him. So you can see Dorfman's influence on Rothbard's The Panic of 1819. This was his dissertation. In the 1960s, Joseph Dorfman invited Rothbard. Rothbard was a attendee at a conference on American history, and Rothbard actually commented on Joseph Dorfman's own work because Rothbard, again, was very knowledgeable about the 1810s and the 1820s because of his dissertation. So Joseph Dorfman really had a, ma a major influence on Rothbard. That's why if you look at uh, his history of economic thought, Rothbard's own series, the two volume series, uh, an Austrian perspective on the history of economic thought, uh, he dedicates the book, I believe, to Joseph Dorfman and Ludwig von Mises, both. And that just shows how much influence Dorfman had on uh, Rothbard. One of the things I, I think is also interesting about Rothbard, I, I know it plays out in, in the progressive era with his analysis on sort of the third political system and things like that. Um, it, was, it was Leonard Liggio. He's got a, an interesting article about uh, Rothbard and Jacksonian banking that kind of ties into Rothbard's experience with Dorfman and the like. But uh, Liggio mentions that uh, Murray Rothbard was very deeply read in the new political history of kind of the you know, first half of the 1900s. Uh, on the ethno-religious approach to political culture. And I think that's interesting when we think about things about liberty versus power narrative, you know, that you have not only uh, uh, the political machinations of those in power rewarding cronies, having their own motivations, but they're also dealing with kind of a different cultural trends within the people themselves, the public itself. And, and this often plays out in you know, the way that different political parties, you know, what ends up fueling their strength or or leading to their downfall, right? That there are larger cultural dynamics at play uh, uh, that can often, you know, overthrow certain political regimes by going too far from where the, the public is. Um, uh, can, can you speak a little bit to to the dynamic of kind of the, the, the uh, altar and throne dynamic? Um, that also played a heavy role in sort of Rothbard's analysis of American history. Yeah, so so first the the, the new political history. This was a very influential field uh, in in the 1970s, trying to explain why people voted and basically argue that voting patterns could be determined by someone's ethno-religious background, whether or not they were German Lutheran or an Irish Catholic, et cetera. And uh, this was something that had always fascinated Rothbard, particularly when understanding or trying to understand the 1800s in this party system of this very intense competition. Everyone is really interested. Yeah, as Rothbard explained, and I always love this in his own lectures, he said, you know, you had people... Uh, everybody and their brother's brother was voting, you know, was, was writing some pamphlet on silver legislation and or tariffs or whatever. And he's like, why were people so interested in economics back then? He said, I, I can't even get my own students to be interested in this. And you're a captive audience, right? So he's speaking to his students. He's basically saying, like, why aren't you guys interested? So I just love that uh, that part, especially. But, yeah, this is this is it's important. Uh, Rothbard wanted to actually explain that ideology did matter. OK, ideology still does matter in a sense that at least it can return. People do vote based off of their ideological convictions. People do vote uh, or they're more energized by more economic issues when they can somehow be tied into local, uh, more cultural issues. And we can even see this today, uh, especially with covid and and mask mandates and, and everything where your average person really doesn't care about the national debt or monetary policy. That's something that's really hard to energize people about. Right. They might care about if prices at, at the at, at the gasoline station are rising, but they do care about school closures, mask mandates. Uh, that stuff's easy to understand. That stuff really hits home. Uh, oh, am I being forced to take a vaccine or not? Right. That's a lot easier to understand than uh, what's this spending bill going to do to interest rates in two years? Like, uh, 
you know, your average person doesn't really know that, right? So this is something that Rothbard had used in his own history, trying to analyze the ethnic background of various voting blocks. So he famously argued that really the uh, the Democratic Party, which was the Libertarian Party in the 1800s, was uh, were sustained, you know, was sustained by uh, liturgical voters, so voters such as um, Irish Catholics and German Lutherans, uh, as opposed to the uh, the political parties of power, such as the Whigs and Republicans, that were sustained by Pietists, these evangelicals who wanted to save the world so they could save themselves, right? And that it relied, to, you know, that meant stamping out sin uh, as well as uh, passing various economic reforms. So that was a very big component of Murray Rothbard's historical outlook. The Alliance of Throne and Altar is also another crucial component of Rothbard's historical outlook. I, I, I really enjoy teaching this to my own students and explaining its relevance to today. The Alliance of Throne and Altar is this, the, basically this, uh, this connection or the relationship between the leader of the government uh, such as the king and a court intellectual, such as the priest. So back in the day, in order for the uh, king to justify his various actions to the public, he would enlist priests and other sort of um, uh, religious uh, uh, intellectuals to say, "Well, the king is divine. The king's words uh, are, you know, are directly from God." In order to save yourself, you have to listen to the king. You have to be conscripted by him. You have to pay taxes, whatever. Blah 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 blah. We don't have that overt religious emphasis anymore, but we still have the very similar principle where court intellectuals now, they might not be a priest, but they're going to be a political scientist or an economist who's going to say, well, you have to listen to our uh, government, uh, you know, you have to listen to your government rulers because their policies are going to increase GDP and it's going to make people better off or it's going to reduce income inequality or it will save the environment or something like that. Or and, they might be a public health expert declaring themselves to be the embodiment of science, like yes, the good Dr. Exactly. Pa, you know, they're saying, well, you have to listen to me. Um, yeah, I, I have, you know, I am the one, uh, basically, uh, you know, r voice in the, in scientific discourse and et cetera. And uh, why do they argue this? Why are so many intellectuals attached to the system? Well, it's very related to uh, the point that Rothbard uh, makes that I find very true. It's that, well, intellectuals are supportive of this in the same way that they're cr critical of capitalism because they know that capitalism won't really provide a demand for their services. So instead, they're going to justify state intervention because the state will turn around and scratch their back. The king would set aside tax money to build a new church for the priest. Nowadays, we employ various intellectuals, academics, economists, political scientists, historians, policy wonks, whatever, at state universities, at large endowed think tanks, in the government, and so on, right? So they're able to justify uh, their own employment when they support various interventions. Yeah, I believe, I know it's true a couple of years ago, I doubt it has gone down ever since, but I believe the largest source of grant money for economists was from the Federal Reserve System. Surprise, surprise, uh, very few economists out there <laughs> depending on such money or is calling for ending the Fed or anything like that. And I, I think particularly right now, you know, especially right now, given how vivid uh, sort of the, the tentacles of the technocracy between the public health authorities, between you know, everything we've seen from the central bank system and, and the Fed and everything like that. I, I think this is one of the things that, that leads, you know, let's call it, you know, kind of Rothbardian libertarianism to, to, carry, uh, uh, to be able to motivate people in a way that perhaps other forms of libertarianism doesn't, is that it, it seems that there's a lot of libertarians out there that tend to agree with the, the end result of a lot of government plans. They, they tend to believe that all in all, they might not always get things right, but the state more or less is a entity trying to, to work in the public interest where it is, it, it very much is that Rothbardian perspective that no, the state is a bunch of you know thieves writ large, that they are ripping us off, and that they're doing so that they're, they're you're using all of these side justifications to just simply defend ultimately what are self serving policies, and then even if there is a degree to which some of these people generally believe that oh giving more more power to 
a Fauci or to the Fed, you know, might have, you know, under you know, overlarging you know, underlying public policy benefits that looking at the operations of the state from the cynical perspective is more often than not going to lead you to more truthful outcomes than assuming good intentions. I, I remember um, when Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe uh, gave a talk at the, the 35th anniversary in New York City a couple of years ago. He talked about Rothbard's interest in, in revisionist history and the, the importance that he placed on it was something that, he, you know, Rothbard's influence awoken him to the importance of looking back at, you know, the, the doctrinaire historical narrative and recognizing how a lot of the way that it is framed within traditional textbooks hides a lot of these underlying sins of the state. And again, I, I think this goes directly to, you know, what, what ends up fueling a lot of, of that sort of heroic aspect of us against, you know, the regime uh, that I, I think kind of goes a long way on why Rothbard continues to resonate so many decades after his passing. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very uh, a good point that, you know, Rothbard's perspective in many ways is unique, or at least it's, it's, it's um, he emphasizes many points people don't, they might agree with, but they don't place as much weight on traditionally in a lot of free market uh, economics, you know, textbooks. Um, in many cases, even in Mises's work, it's you assume well they got the best of intentions. You assume what they're saying is 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 true, and then you really talk about unintended consequences. So that well, good intentions don't lead to good results. So a politician is pushing for minimum wage because they think it will increase employment, help people who are poor off, and then it will actually uh, well it turns out that it leads to unemployment. And it hurts those people, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, you kind of go through this this cute little analysis and, and and so on. And well, I think that explains part of it. I think certainly some politicians or some people they do have good intentions, or at least they think they're helping. But for a lot of things, even including the same politicians, well, they they also are pushing for their own special interests. Even if you take the minimum wage, for example, the actual origins of the minimum wage during the progressive era, first on the state level in the, in the 1910s, and then on the federal level in the 1930s, really at the state level, it was designed to uh, unemploy people. It was designed to unemploy immigrants and women and children who were competing with the white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant unions, the male, uh, you know, the, the white men, the, 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 the blue collar um, uh, working class, so to speak, who was pushing for various restrictions on immigration and so on in order to, you know, to, to keep their own wages high. The minimum wage is just another tool for that. So you see, well, the cronyism is, 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 is still there. Right. The cronyism explains the minimum wage. And in many ways, it could probably even explain some of the minimum wage uh, debates. Now, when you look at who are the biggest proponents of minimum wage increases, it's always unions, even though, curiously enough, many of these unions are already paying their workers at prices, at wages higher than uh, the minimum wage they're, they're, they're advocating for. So you say, OK, well, why are unions that are paying uh, their own uh, members, you know, their, their, their own members are earning $20 an hour with the company that, you know, the, the union's working for? Why are they pushing to raise the minimum wage to 10 or $15? Well, it comes from the fact that they know if you raise the wage of competition artificially, you're going to make them less attractive for employers to hire. So if you raise the price of teenagers, <laughs> uh, you, you, you make them unprofitable for a business to hire, they're going to switch to slightly higher unionized members, increasing the demand for those workers, right? So you go, oh, okay, so maybe it isn't these, you know, these good intentions lead to good results. It's kind of the bad intentions. And this is uh, something that Rothbard always emphasized, and I think it's important to, to look at because this is really understanding people's motivations. Okay, this is really just engaging in that practice, you know, the, 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 the science that Mises, uh, you know, articulated thymology uh, and really just applying it. And when you do that, you get a much richer understanding of the world. Um, unlike praxeology, which is very logic-based, abstract, you don't need empirical evidence, this, of course, is very empirical. 
You have to constantly be reading empirical information, looking at motivations, changing your hypotheses, et cetera. But when you when you do this enough and you get the right explanation, you you, you hit on it, uh, it, it really does open uh, open minds. And that's why I think it's so important to uh, explain uh, cronyism, explain Mises' thymo you know, th thymology, et cetera, to as many people as we can. And of course, when we talk about this dynamic of, you know, large corporations taking advantage of the public, you know, this is something that's not necessarily exclusively libertarian in terms of its application, right? You know, and, and I, I know some of the conversations we've had off air, um, you know, this liberty versus power framework that, that Rothbard uses in history, it's not necessarily unique to him. Uh, one of the, I love reading uh, Gore Vidal's historical novels. He kind of takes a similar sort of cynical approach with his uh, narratives of empire highlighting, you know, kind of the, the general erosion of, of the republic into the state that we have now. Um, you know, one of the great uh, historical books about uh, the Jacksonian era is Liberty and Power uh, by Harry Watson. Reading this is clearly not, you know, some sort of laissez-faire libertarian in, a, in the truest sense. There is this kind of constant dynamic uh, amongst some some left economists as well. I, I know, I, I believe um, one of the big battles that Joseph Dorfman had um, that kind of inspired Murray early on was a narrative that was going on amongst uh, prominent award-winning economists trying to make uh, uh, the, the, mod, the, the current wave of LBJ-style uh, uh, liberal, in that sense, politics, trying to tie that to the Jacksonian tradition, where Dorfman kind of you <laughs> a really highlighted a, a, an alternative view that was pretty compelling in terms of the underlying evidence. There is a, a constant battle here, and I think this is why Rothbard's history is something that we should be motivated by and why I'm glad people like yourself are building upon that tradition, is that ultimately there is a culture war aspect of this economic history. Uh, Ryan McMakin last year had a great article about economics as a culture war issue that good history and good economics, fundamentally, it plays the role of illustrating for your average person, again, who, who is the group of people ripping you off? And this is something that obviously the left has been able to, to hijack in its own way. I, I think of Howard Zinn's People's History in the United States, right? You know, that's kind of a, a you know, a, a, a ideological history for a certain position. Rothbard is sort of the counterbalance to that. And so can, can you kind of build off of, you know, the way that you see historical analysis playing out, not only in just having a better understanding of what really happened, but in terms of perhaps some of these culture war divides that we have going on in the country right now? Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of good stuff uh, to discuss there. Um, I, the the liberty versus power theory, or the the the, the I, what I call a theory, as I said, it's not you know I, I I thank Rothbard, but something that I try to argue in my book as Rothbard did is that this was actually something that not only older historians spoke about, most famously Lord Acton, you could say, but also contemporaries. So Bernard Bailyn, uh, who was the uh, dissertation advisor of Gordon Wood, another famous American historian, both of them wrote on this and both of them uh, discussed that, you know, Americans back in the day, they really did see things through this lens of liberty and power, right? They viewed liberty as the source of all sorts of inspiration and uh, growth and flourishing, while power was this cancerous tumor. It was literally encroaching on everything. It was corrupting, and that's why you you know this has been you see in, in uh, depicting a central bank as this massive hydra with all sorts of tentacles, right? Uh, as the Jacksonians did, because they still they too viewed things in terms of this liberty versus power framework. It's important to note. And this is something I try and do in, in my book will show that, yeah, this theme, this is people actually not only did hold this perspective, but it actually is, is a good explanation of why things proceeded or how things proceeded in the way they did. Because historians frequently try to look back on the past and sort of take maybe a current issue in the present and show, well, it actually has this long and storied history. So, you know, obviously a libertarian such as myself is going to look back at America's libertarian tradition. Uh, someone who, such as Arthur Schlesinger, 
who is that historian you were mentioning, uh, who's trying to argue that back in the days of, of, of FDR, the New Deal. Well, FDR is really in many ways, uh, he can be his heritage, you know, that this, this interventionist Democrat perspective fighting for the common man against the entrenched uh, interests, the, the uh, aristocracy. Uh, well, he's really, you know, uh, Andrew Jackson is, is similar to FDR, right? And so that took Joseph Dorfman to say, well, no, Andrew Jackson, he was fighting the, uh, when, he, when he was fighting, you know, these large businesses or these entrenched interests, it wasn't because of capitalism, it was because they had various government privileges, right? And you see this with Howard Zinn uh, and other historians nowadays. So because uh, critical race theory is very important and the big 1619 project and everything. So you're going to look back into history and you're going to see, well, well there were people who are arguing our perspective uh, that, you know, race relations was this, this big issue and and all sorts of other stuff. And that's why America history is all doom, gloom and boom, so to speak. And it's important to uh, obviously, you know, respectfully engage the literature, at least as respectfully as, as, as we can and, and try and show that, well, that's incorrect. There's actually, you know, this is a much more uh, convincing explanation of what happened because there are parallels with the modern day cultural wars, et cetera, because people are always trying to look back in into history and sort of in order to support their their own viewpoint. So we do see, you know, the, the these themes of when it's not, trying to look back into, oh, you know, trying to paint Andrew Jackson as a proto FDR guy. Now it's, let's try and paint Andrew Jackson as some sort of genocidal maniac or, or whatever, which is, which is not true. That's just a distortion of the facts. And it's important to really combat these uh, and to produce good history because history is how, history absolutely influences our perspective on the present day. And I think, as libertarians, the preservation of American history is particularly important because I, I know that Murray was very proud of the American Revolution, you know, discussing it as a people's war, a, a battle for, you know, liberation. And, and I think that's, you know, there are so few cultures that are, you know, really cultivated, conceived in liberty, so to speak, and, and that, you know, I, I think that it is not a coincidence that a lot of, you know, the degree to which the current progressive left is trying to go after everyone, right? It, it, and the whole thing is that you, they, they kind of overplay their hand to a certain extent. It's, it's, it's one thing to criticize Andrew Jackson based off of, you know, the treatment of, of Native Americans or going after Thomas Jefferson for being a slaveholder. But, but once, uh, uh, you know, Louis von Mises and Milton Friedman and James Buchanan are all, you know, frothing racists that are trying to, you know, put in place a system of, of you know, continual oppression through uh, a, an embrace of charter schools or, or whatever some of these modern new histories are. Um, you kind of see exactly, you know, if, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? And so if, if you're a leftist, everything's a racist. But but again, though, we're, we're seeing an amplification of this battle within this entire new sort of era of of really left wing conspiracy theories of the Nancy McLeans, of the Quinn Slobodians, of the 19, 16, or 1619 project. And again, I, I think it's interesting. I think it is to a detriment that you know, there are not more people doing the work that you have done. Uh, our, our friend Chris Calton um, with, with, with his great podcast a few years ago. Uh, taking an, you know, a a Misesi and Rothbardian lens at history, um, you know, I, one of the things that I think has always led to the Austrian tradition being so rich and vibrant was, you know, you know, obviously back at in you know, the University of Vienna, you didn't you know, simply specialize in economists. You know, Mises studied law and he studied history, he studied philosophy and the like. That it is precisely the contributions that Austrian thought provides, not simply to economics narrowly. But to political science, um, as Ryan McMakin often argues, to history, to these other social disciplines, that you need all of them to really defend any of them. That simply defending things on purely economic grounds isn't enough, particularly when the other side is able to, you know, just kind of pitch their own very simplistic narrative. We have to have our own pushback you know, against that. And that, that's why I think, again, that this liberty versus power narrative is so important, providing 
that, 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 that important lens, right? When we think about Marxism, for example, it's, it's his class theory really is what has, has I think, kind of continued that tradition. No, no matter uh, the failings of socialism in a practical realm, it's that, that politics of envy, that uh, of, of, you know, the, the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie that has now been kind of remade made over in so many different ways, you know, cultural Marxism, et cetera, et cetera. But it's this constant oppressor versus oppressor, or, uh, oppressor versus the oppressed dynamic that continues to give fuel to his cause. It is precisely what Rothbard does with his history that I think keeps this dynamic flame alive in this framework. And so you know, do, do you think that we need more historians, more social scientists broadly to help kind of keep the Austrian tradition alive today? Uh, keep it thriving today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think history, uh, philosophy, political science, very important. I think we need more historians. I think history in particular. Uh, at the Supporter Summit, I, uh, when the book was released, Cronians was released, I explained, you know, I, I, I gave at least my case for why uh, why someone in 2021 would profit by, from reading a book that ends in 1849, right? So what's the what, what could someone learn? And I explained, well, history provides lots of case studies of cronyism or of the free market or the quasi-free market working. History can all, is also interesting, so it's, it's easy to engage people. Economics can be very theoretically abstract, OK, uh, then there's also, you know, again, modern uh, the modern political battles on the other side. You know, the other side is waging their various political battles using history. We've seen this with the 1619 Project and other things. So uh, in order to influence someone on current events, such as on inflation, people are looking back on the 1970s. Uh, then again, you have someone, Paul Krugman, looking back, oh, the inflation after World War II, et cetera. So in order to basically... Um, you know, illuminate our perspective on the present. We have to look back at the past. Okay. Um, and then the last uh, reason I gave was I think that I said, uh, you know, there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You had reform movements in the past, but all of that was trying to emphasize the importance of history, why we need uh, historians, et cetera, because this, you know, history is how we learn. Your average person, they have an anti capitalist, pro interventionist bias because of. Uh, the the various history classes they've they've taken right or they've slowly been ingrained with you know oh of course we all need to wear face masks because if we didn't wear face masks and the government didn't take care of our health well we'd still have rats falling into you know being made into sausages and 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 uh, you know of people falling into vats that were turned into meat and all sorts of stuff like that so that's very important uh, history is a crucial discipline that needs to be uh, basically continue to defend. This relates to something Rothbard had described as at various points in time as a science of liberty. It might be more accurately described as sciences, sciences of liberty, but it was his way of describing the overarching uh, framework of libertarianism, which not only included economic history, also, excuse me, not only included economic theory, but also included history, economic history, political science, sociology, et cetera, and showing how all of these disciplines kind of reinforce uh, each other and support this idea of a voluntary society, the, that the free market uh, provides the great the greatest human flourishing uh, as opposed to the government, et cetera. So it's important to realize that it's it's a unified uh, it's it's a unified front, so to speak. You, you have to be moving along on, on all the frontiers in order to really accomplish your objectives. And this is why uh, the, the Journal of Libertarian Studies as one of the the platforms for a lot of the research in this area. Um, you know, recently we we. Uh, brought it back a few years ago with with uh, the, the uh, Libertarian Scholars Conference that we ha haven't held the last couple of years because uh, usually it's a New York thing and it hasn't been very friendly territory uh, ever since uh, early 2020. But I, I think you know, there's a lot of value for for anyone out there interested in in you know, looking at the kind of the non economic parts of kind of Mises Institute content. Uh, some of the old JLS articles has some really fascinating uh, uh, contributions by, by all sorts of great names on you know, history, theory, and the like, and, and get some, some really interesting things out there. Um, so for the first season 
of Liberty versus Power. We are going to be diving into your newest book, Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America. Um, you know, we're going to be taking it part, part by part. We're going to allow you to kind of expand on some of the historical anecdotes that you've brought in and, and kind of highlight some of the, the, the kind of the important takeaways, kind of have this provide a role of, uh, you know, a, a cliff notes, if you will, but, uh, you know, also just a platform for expanding upon what, what pages, uh, uh, you, know, you have to, you know, couldn't get all in there. I, I know in your early draft of the book, it was much larger than the final product. Um, can, can you talk about just, you know, conclusion here, um, you know, just, just a little bit about the work that you put into the book itself. Obviously, you had a tremendous amount of uh, you know, familiarity with Conceived in Liberty and Rothbard's history of early America. Um, but you know, as, a, as a last little tease, can you just talk about a little bit about the production of cronyism and your process throughout writing it? Yeah, so I, I, I'm an economist. I, I don't believe in the labor theory of value, but I, I can't tell you I worked hard on it. <laughs> but so that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good book, uh, but hopefully it might give an indicator. Uh, yeah, this, this is something that I've spent the past two years working on. I was asked to write a history of crony capitalism, and I decided to focus initially on early American history before moving on to later historical periods, which I'm currently researching right now. And yeah, yeah, this, this book is it really is my attempt to try to can sort of flesh out that science of liberty that Rothbard had argued for, sort of continue the story of Conceived in Liberty and basically try to explain it, you know, update it with new source material, et cetera. And this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about very proud of. I'm, I'm glad that various people have been reading it or, or been buying the book, et cetera. And this is really just shows that, you know, there, there are people who are interested in this material. There are, you know, there, there is a, a natural audience for history and for a study of cronyism. And this is one of the ways that I think is the best way of, uh, is, is really the best way of convincing people uh, the, the you know the the benefits of the free market and libertarianism because this is something Rothbard had explained when he was researching American history and most people don't learn through economics they learn through case studies etc. So I had written this 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 big book of you know 550 pages over about two years uh, but I was advised particularly by Chris Calton, who you mentioned, to cut it down really just to squeeze out some extraneous facts or improve the writing. And it really did improve the quality. So it's in many ways, it's a labor of love. And I'm very happy to be going on this podcast and talking about it with you. Well, and hopefully this is a nice little you know, taste of what we're looking to bring to the table here with the Liberty versus Power podcast. I'm very excited to be talking with you more going forward about not only your book, but other fascinating little periods of American history, providing a perspective that only a Rothbardian truly can. Uh, with that being said, this has been the, in the inauguration of Liberty versus Power. I hope you'll join us for future episodes. And as always, if you like this and want more content, you can find articles, podcasts, lectures, and more at Mises.org. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.